Doctors, what made you say, how are you still alive? Story one, pathologist here. I had a guy who passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. I soon learned he was the recipient of a lung transplant about 15 years prior. When I opened the man up, his transplanted lung was upside down. I flipped the lung into the proper position and blooped. It flipped right back upside down. That was quite alarming. The surgeons who originally performed the transplant incorrectly attached the organ. When he, by chance, entered the correct position, the lung flipped over, causing his pulmonary artery to seal shut, resulting in a massive heart attack and his demise. The surgeons installed the lung in the correct orientation, but attached it incorrectly. The resulting torsion caused the lung to flip over inside the man's chest 15 years later, ending his life. The man lived for 15 years with a lung that was eager to flip upside down, and it was only by sheer chance that he didn't move in such a way that it allowed it to do so until the fateful day of his passing. It is one of the most fascinating cases I have ever witnessed. I don't typically receive the consequential information from my report after I submit it, but in my experience, this would be a hard sell in court. The man lived for 15 years with a high quality of life despite the surgeon's error. He absolutely crushed the expectancy odds. There might be repercussions from the board, but legally, meh. It's a shame to say, but if it was discovered in the first four years, then I can guarantee there would have been legal consequences. Story 2. Not a doctor. My grandfather had a heart attack. He went in for a simple stent in his heart. Hours go by and we hear code blue over the intercom. The doctor comes out to tell us his left ventricle has an inch and a half tear in it. They had to transport him to another hospital ASAP. He coded three times that night and went through 11 transfusions. The surgeon successfully repaired the torn ventricle. They woke him up on my birthday and he sang me a happy birthday. After three weeks in the cardiac ICU, my grandfather walked out. The surgeon told us that for a man of 75 years to have lived through a left ventricle tear, it was unheard of. The doctor wrote a journal about him as well. He's still alive today. He even got his hip replaced a year later. This dude's grandpa is going to survive us all. If you think this grandpa's recovery was amazing, you should check out the kid's recovery in Story 5. It's wild. Story 3. A patient I took care of had a car fall on his face. He was underneath it working when it slid off the jack. The only reason he survived was because he broke every bone in his face. He had a leopard 3 which allowed for his brain to swell. He also needed additional surgery to relieve the pressure of cerebral edema which the facial fractures did allow for a great deal of give in his skull. I was rotating through the ICUs, so I first saw him just a day after the incident. His head was so swollen, he didn't even look human. Fast forward a few weeks later, I was rotating through a different unit in the hospital and came across the same patient. He was quickly recovering and had minimal neurodeficiencies. For patient privacy purposes, I cannot give the age of the patient or the location of the accident. I'm also not disclosing how long ago this was for the same reason. As for minimal neurodeficiencies, I saw this patient very briefly a few weeks after the incident. At the time, he still had edema and was in the process of getting better every day. I used that wording considering the severity of his injuries. He still had progress to make, but was able to walk and talk and had no memory deficits. Not including immediately after the incident and his time in the ICU, of course. I did not follow his care all the way through to discharge, so I don't know what he was like then or in the months following the accident. I wouldn't be surprised if he went on to go to college and is now living a normal life. He was a younger patient and younger brains tend to be more plastic in that they can recover from injuries better than someone who is older. I know some would wonder why they don't break facial bones as a last dish effort to relieve brain swelling. They do break the skull, just not the facial bones. They can make small holes called burr holes or if the swelling is really bad, they can temporarily remove entire pieces of the skull, a craniotomy. Sometimes pieces of the skull are stored in the abdomen to keep them alive so that they can be put back later. Story 4. About 20 years ago, I had a patient come in with obstruction of his colon from a large colon cancer. The cancer had spread to his liver, and a CT scan showed the liver was basically replaced by a metastatic tumor, so he wouldn't perish from intestinal obstruction. The patient, his family, and I decided to try placing an expandable metal stent through the tumor. It worked. His obstruction was relieved and he was able to go home to spend his last days with his family. 18 months later, the patient came in for an office visit. For heartburn, he was even more jaundiced than when I first met him, but he felt basically well and was eating well. 
The stent was still functioning. I never saw him again and assumed he finally succumbed to his disease, but he got at least 18 months of precious and really good time. The patient was lucky that he didn't pass away from intestinal obstruction. It is a very unpleasant way to go. Basically, your digestive tract turns food into crap. If there is a blockage, the crap can't be pooped out. You end up vomiting it. And you obviously can't eat, so you basically vomit waste and starve. Or your bowel perforates because blockage cuts off blood flow. Your intestine dies and spills bacteria into all your other organs, and you go into sepsis and pass away. Simply put, anyway. Story 5 I am not a doctor, but have been a paramedic for 15 years. I had a young kid on a ripstick, similar to a skateboard, lose control and roll into the path of an oncoming USV in his neighborhood. We arrived to find him face down under the vehicle, unconscious and barely breathing. After all was said and done, he had bilateral femur fractures, one lower leg fracture, multiple rib fractures and a blown pupil, an open skull fracture and a subdural brain bleed. Attention pneumo, air escaping lungs into the chest cavity, will squish the lungs and heart if untreated. And when we were bagging him, breathing for him, we felt subcutaneous emphysema, free air that crackles like Rice Krispies or bubble wrap in his hip. Yes, hip. We flew him to the children's hospital expecting him to perish within the hour. He was in a coma for days and had to have multiple surgeries, but made a complete recovery, 100% neurologically intact as well, and graduates high school in the spring. His was such an amazing case that the hospital made him one of their miracle kids of the year. Parents, please make your kids wear helmets, even in the neighborhood. It wouldn't have prevented all of his injuries, but it would have substantially lessened the brain trauma he suffered. Story 6. First, some backstory. In Brazil, you can start an internship way earlier than in most American and European medical schools, so keep that in mind. I was in my fourth year of medical school and on my first day as an intern in a trauma hospital. After training, there was a bus crash right before, so all the staff was occupied when a woman came in screaming, My life is about to end! I got in the head! She told us she owed money to a dealer. Now I believe her because she has burn marks and gunpowder right there in her skin and a hole. Let me remind you that I am a student and there are no available doctors at the moment. So I ran to my professor who was with another patient and relayed the story. I also told my professor that the patient is lucid and has normal vital signs. He ordered me to do a CT scan. The CT shows that the bullet entered the forehead through the first layer of the frontal bone, but not the second, headed down through the palate and stopped on her fifth cervical vertebra. There was no brain damage at all. So we admitted her and did a trachestomy along with emergency reconstructive surgery only a first, not definitive approach, along with a cervical collar. After she was stable, three hours later in her room, we went down to see other patients. The ER then gets a call. Hello, we are from the X hospital, 20 kilometers away from ours, and we found a patient of yours in our emergency. Then the nurses on the floor realized she was missing. She jumped a third storage floor, broke her ankle, and got on buses and went to the other hospital. Why? She said, I saw him there. He came to finish the job. And before you ask, yes, some people lost their jobs. Story 7. I had a gentleman in his late 50s come in with multiple myeloma. Short history of progressively worsening breathlessness. Turned out he had a pulmonary embolism, blood clot in his lungs. He was a good candidate for surgery, so he had the blood clot removed. But unfortunately, the clot had caused such bad issues with his heart, acute right heart failure that he couldn't be weaned off the bypass machine. Instead, he went to the ICU on ECMO, like a circuit for your heart and lungs outside the body to give your heart and lungs time to rest. His chest was still open, cannulated centrally, but covered up with sterile stuff. After three days, he was booked to be weaned off the ECMO, or at least have the tubes put in peripherally so his chest could be closed. On the morning of the procedure, while he's waiting to be moved, Somehow the tubing of the ECMO machine broke, the oxygenator tube, and hemoglobin spilled all over the floor and he went into cardiac arrest. The cardiothoracic consultant had to do internal cardiac massage, basically CPR on the heart by squeezing it via his still open chest, until the circuit got fixed and he returned to normal circulation. He ended up going to the OT and having his chest closed, but he had more clots pulled out of his pulmonary arteries. 
clots had recurred. At this point, I thought this guy was utterly screwed. I figured if he even lived long enough to be woken up, he'd have some degree of ischemic brain surgery. After two weeks, the guy left the ICU and a week later went into rehabilitation, speaking, walking, and cognitively largely intact. It was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen during my short career. For a while, that was some scary stuff. Good thing the patient pulled through. If you want to watch more WTF videos like this, like this video and subscribe to my channel now. Story 8. I am not a doctor, but a few years ago, I was called into the hospital to go see my friend unexpectedly. Once there, the doctors told me my friend should be gone if not in a coma. What had happened was that day, my town had a beer fest on Main Street. It was $20 all you could drink. We all partied, but I was sober at the time, so I just enjoyed watching my friends get ripped. Fast forward to later that afternoon, when all my friends had moved on to a friend's house, but now hard alcohol was involved. I went home at this point because I wasn't in the party mood. My good friend hit it hard, though. He was gone. Three sheets to the wind. Hammered. He ended up taking another friend's motor scooter out for a joyride. He ended up wrecking it pretty damn hard on his head. When I showed up at the hospital, it was a mess. He was conscious and a big smile went across his face when I walked in. Then he tried to escape. He was pulling IVs and wires off him, but I stopped him. He blew a point thirty-five a few hours after the incident. He was a pretty heavy drinker. Tolerance saved him. Doctors told me they were in shock that he wasn't in a coma or gone. Needless to say, it humbled him pretty well. Story 9 I'm not a doctor, but two months ago, my boyfriend's brother, 29 years old, was on a Craigslist gig trimming a large tree, pretty high up, 30 feet to be exact. When he slipped and fell down, his feet pointed to the ground. The harness failed or he just thought he was invincible, typical of him, and didn't buckle in. He was in one of the top trauma wards for two weeks. The day he was released was when they found out his pelvis was fractured. They said he wouldn't be able to walk for six months and he would never be the same. He would be crippled for life. He has spent the last two weeks doing his thing without his wheelchair, walker, or cane, playing frisbee, golf, and fishing. He was running around doing everything he used to. He is extremely lucky. Also, I forgot to mention that he was fully awake and conscious the entire time until first responders could come to him. About 10 to 15 minutes. Story 10. A guy came in with a bit of chest pain. He told me the big coronary artery on the front of his heart was 100% blocked. I asked him, who told you that? He said his doctor did about 10 years ago. I didn't believe him since patients never ever get any of the stuff their doctor tells them right. I let the cardiac surgeon know what this guy said and he too goes, haha, 100%? So he's dead. If the biggest coronary artery has been totally occluded for 10 years, no less, you are a dead man. Lo and behold, we got an angiogram and it was 100% occluded. The artery in the back of the heart made a connection with the front of the heart to pick up the slack. He was a lucky guy. Wow, this dude was a zombie for 10 whole years. Story 11. I used to work as a clerk in diagnostic imaging at a hospital, and we had a man come in for an x-ray complaining of chest pain. His record showed his last visit was two years prior, when he got buzzed and fell into a fish tank breaking it. The ER stitched him up and sent him home. Fast forward two years and we all gathered around the computer screen looking at an x-ray that showed a 12-inch long pierce of fish tank glass sitting in his chest with his aorta resting right on top of it. It was on an angle running from his left shoulder down towards his right hip. There were other shards of glass too, but this one was the biggest. Emergency surgery happened right away. Story 12 I'm not a doctor, but I'm a nurse and my story is good too. I had a college student come into the unit on the night of their birthday. They wanted to party but had a test the next morning. One of their friends told them that if they took one Adderall for every drink that they had, they'd be sober by the morning. They had 15 shots and 15 20 milligram Adderall tablets. If you were wondering, no, that does not make you sober. It does, however, make you rip off all your clothes in a hallway, spit at the nurse that is trying to help you, take a crap over everything, and then literally be gone. Luckily for them, they didn't pass away for good. We got them back and they spent most of their sophomore year of college in a hospital, with a hole in their neck, learning how to walk again. 
Story 13. I am not a doctor, but I work in cardiology, and my doctors all do rotations at our hospital. Our hospital is a level 5 trauma center, and it's the closest hospital to a lot of rural areas, so a lot of traumas that happen way out in the middle of nowhere end up at that hospital. This guy came in having been in a car accident. He was covered in road rash, and he has a big wound in his chest. Apparently, we all later learned he'd been drinking and was a passenger in his friend's car. He wanted out of the car, but his friend said no. So this guy, once again hammered, decided to try and jump out of the car window. He somewhat succeeded, but his shirt caught on the side view mirror, and he got dragged until the driver stopped flipping out enough to come to his senses and stop. I guess this dude thought that movie stunts were easy to do in real life and tried it out for himself. Story 14. Paramedics here. So many, but two come to mind. I responded to a well-being check, basically checking on someone no one has heard from in a while. I get there and the police advise that the woman is gone and appear to be so for a while, middle of summer. I can smell her before getting close to the house. I put on protective gear and air packs to move the body. We carefully move her into the body bag and she opens her eyes and gasps. She was alive. We got her to the hospital alive and she lived for several days more. The second was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was awake and tried to talk but obviously couldn't. We ended up sedating and intubating, but he lived and walked out of the hospital after tons of reconstructive surgery. Story 15. An old guy comes in with his wife. She tells me he passed out last week and I couldn't wake him up. After about two minutes, he came around and he didn't want to go to the hospital. So we booked an appointment to see you. I'm a little concerned by this and his heart rate is a little slow. So I sent him for an EKG, heart rhythm tracing. I got a call about an hour later from the cardiologist reviewing the EKG, calmly thanking me for sending him in because the wiring in his heart essentially wasn't working and he could drop dead at any moment. Again, because the week before, he hadn't passed out, he died. Through some lucky miracle, his heart started again. He's got a pacemaker now and he and his wife are doing just great. Story 16. I was seeing a new patient but could not focus on my exam because the younger sister, who I was not seeing that day, looked like a freaking ghost. I finally asked the mom if I could check the little sister's hemoglobin. It was 2.1. Mom was planning to bring her in the next week to discuss pica. She had severe iron deficiency anemia caused by a daily milk intake of around 60 ounces. She probably would not have survived until the last appointment had mom not brought her along to the sibling's visit. Story 17. I was on rotation in a rural place when I met a guy who had been out in the woods somewhere when he suddenly felt faint and sweaty with severe pain in his belly. He collapsed but somehow managed to crawl out toward the main road where he got the attention of a passing car that brought him to the hospital. He had an abdominal aortic aneurysm that had ruptured with all his blood pumping out into his belly and somehow he survived till he got to a hospital and had emergency surgery. When I met him, he had recovered and was nearly discharged home. He showed me his scar, telling me he didn't know how he made it either, except that he wasn't going to if he didn't keep crawling. They were really made tough out there. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy Doctors, what's your this just got even worse moment? Story 5 is out of this world. See you on that video.